and welcome to Announcing the Game, where professional public address announcers share their expertise and best practices to make you a better public address announcer. I'm Tom Winicky, a public address announcer for field hockey. I've announced high school field hockey for 15 years, and I've also announced collegiate field hockey since 2015, mainly at Syracuse University of the Atlantic Coast Conference, but also at Colgate University of the Patriot League. When Syracuse University hosted the ACC Field Hockey Tournament in 2021, I announced those games over the three-day tournament. I've also announced other Division I sports, including football, men's and women's soccer, men's and women's ice hockey, men's and women's basketball, men's and women's lacrosse, as well as softball. I also announced the New York State Public High School Athletic Association State Championships for girls lacrosse, and for football. In this episode of Announcing the Game, I'm going to talk to you about field hockey. Now most of this will refer to the collegiate game, but much of what I have to say you can relate directly to the high school game. I'll be talking about getting yourself ready before even getting to the game site. What to take care of once you get there before the game starts. What to say during the game including understanding some basic rules, and then how to wrap up each game. Have you ever thought about your tools? You know, what you bring to each game. Now, of course, there are rosters and spreadsheets. I'll talk more about those in a minute. But what about the other things you need? How many pencils do you bring? Do they have erasers? Do you have one of those pencil sharpeners with you? Do you use pens? What about different color pens? Maybe one of those pens that has four different colors in one pen. Highlighters? Do you highlight the starters for the starting lineups? Do you need different colors? What if you're outside of the press box and it's a windy day? Do you have a roll of tape to tape things down with? What if it's raining? Do you have a plastic bag big enough to cover your clipboard when you use it to go look for starting lineups? What if you're up in a press box? Can you see the numbers on the uniforms on the far side of the field? Look to invest in a good set of binoculars for that one. What about batteries? Have you ever announced a game with a wireless mic and the batteries went dead on you? Are you prepared with some double A's and nine volts, just in case? What about a small extension cord? Do you have a spare audio cable? I have a playlist on my phone when I announced high school games and I also did the music. I'm ready just in case that site can't access their music. Are you prepared? Just in case? What about emergency scripts? Do you have a set of those for any situation you can come up with? Now, the chances of needing some of these things are pretty small, but I don't like to run the risk of needing something and then finding out that I don't have it. Do you have something to drink during the game? Water's always good. Me, I like hot lemon echinacea tea, as hot as I can stand it. Stay away from things with caffeine or sugar in it. That can only cause phlegm to build up in your throat. Lozenges? Look for those whose first ingredient is pectin. Stay away from those whose first ingredient is menthol. That'll just dry out your throat. Let's start with what to do before you ever get to the game site. I like to print out rosters for both teams and sort the player's information in a way that I will say it for pre-game introductions. Most rosters for college teams are posted on their websites and they're usually organized in a different way than how I want to say it. They're usually organized number first, then name, year, position, height, and then hometown. And that would be awkward to read. You would have to say something like, Number 12, Molly Nager, a senior forward who's five foot four from Boston, Massachusetts. That doesn't sound right. So what I do is I copy and paste each roster into a spreadsheet. Then I resort the columns so the lines horizontally are for the players and they're organized in a way that I will say it for introductions. I'll resort them to read as position, height, year in school, hometown, number, name. Then it reads, 
Starting at forward, a 5'4 senior from East Syracuse, New York, number 12, Emily Langan. Now it's a bit of work on my part initially, but I found that on game day, with everything else that's going on, this makes it easy just to read from left to right across the page, instead of having to jump around from column to column if I just print off the roster from their website. Now you can see here is an example of a field hockey roster that I've sorted in the way that I would say it for pregame introductions. Position, height, grade in school, hometown, number, and name. And you can see some of the overseas hometowns that I've looked up and had them spelled out phonetically. This just makes it easier on game day just to read across the lines. Then I create a sheet for individual goals scored. I list each player on both teams numerically with a blank space next to each name. In that space, I look up how many goals that player has that season. I do this on the team's website and there's always a link that says statistics. That allows me to say something like, Syracuse goal, her first of the afternoon and fourth of the season, scored by number five, Emily Langan. With the assist to number three, Molly Nager. That's Langan from Nager. Time of the goal, 6.45 of the first period. I just feel this adds a little more professionalism to my announcements, as well as giving a player credit not only for that goal that day, but for all the goals they've scored that season. Now I also have a sheet that I'll use to keep track of substitutions and any penalties and when they expire. Penalties are in the form of a card. A green card is two minutes. Yellow card is five minutes. And a red card expels that player from the remainder of that game. Now I keep track because many scoreboards don't have the ability to show penalty time. I announce who got the card and how long it's for. And then I'll announce when on the clock the penalty will expire. For example, Syracuse green card at number 12, Lori Valentine. Two minutes for the green card. That green card will expire at 5.43. Now even if that scoreboard can show penalty time, I still want to announce when the penalty is released. This just helps teams and fans stay more informed. Now, one thing to remember, penalties do not get released if a goal is scored. The player serves the entire time on their card. Here is an example of the stat sheet that I'll use to keep track of goals scored and that I can announce during the game. I've circled the number of goals that the individual player has coming into the game and then wrote potential numbers afterwards. So if number five, Emily Langan, gets a goal, I cross off number four and announce it as her first of the afternoon and fourth of the season. Then next to it, I have a sheet where I can keep track of penalty cards for both teams, goals and assists, and the time of each goal for both teams, and substitutions during the game. As you said, they come pretty quickly, so it's good to write them down, and it's easier to keep track of them, I feel, this way. We all know rule number one of public address announcing, right? Rule number one, always get the names pronounced correctly. Rule number two, Never break rule number one. I plan to get to a game site 75 to 90 minutes before game time. Now I get there that early so I can make sure that my interactions with the visiting team are taken care of well before they get into their pregame routines. I want to respect what they need to do on game day without having to stop to meet with me to go over names or hometowns. Now, I always like to stay away from head coaches they've got enough on their minds already. I look for a trainer first to go over those names and hometowns. Now, oftentimes they can help me. If not, they'll call over an assistant coach to help me out. And that's fine if they initiate that contact. I won't initiate it, but I'll go along with it if it comes from them. Now, I even have had the chance to talk to some head coaches who are more than happy to help me. I just don't want to impose myself on them though. I'll wait for that to come from somebody else. Now at the collegiate level, many players are from overseas and their names and hometowns can be challenging, but I enjoy those challenges. It's their name and their hometown after all, and they deserve my best effort to get it right for them. Now for hometowns, I'll do a little bit of homework before I get to the game site. I'll do a search on YouTube to look for a video where that hometown is mentioned. 
I'll even put in the words local newscast into the search bar to see if I can get a local newscast of a local person saying the hometown. So when I show up on game day and I have that hometown from Germany or Belgium pronounced correctly, I think they appreciate that. They appreciate my effort that I put into it already and they take me a little more seriously. Sometimes the trainers or coaches may not know themselves how to pronounce a name correctly or a hometown. They may have a nickname for the player and that's fine. Now I'll never ask for this, but oftentimes they will call the player over to have them say their own name and hometown for me. When they say it to me and I repeat it back, if I get something along the lines of, oh, that's okay, that's close enough, don't worry. I say, no, I'll apologize and ask them to say it again. And I'll repeat it again until I get it right. And that extra 10 or 15 seconds, they really appreciate that for me. My effort to make sure I get it right for them. Remember, rule number one. Now, when working with marketing and music during the game, everything is probably already on a script. See if you can get that script emailed to you ahead of time so you can rehearse it before game day. Now, once at the game site, know what you're expected to say and when you're expected to say it. Get a cue from the marketing person as to when to talk. So everything is coordinated between your announcements and any music or any promotions that are going on. As for reading your copy, be sure to sound like you're talking to someone instead of reading something off of a page. It's very easy to tell the difference. Now, for example, announcing the national anthem is done very differently than starting lineups. And a halftime on-field contest is announced much differently than one about emergency exits. For the National Anthem, for example, I have a set script that I like to use that I've received a lot of positive feedback about. I start by saying, ladies and gentlemen, we now ask that if you are able to please rise and please remove your caps. I do that because every facility has handicap seating. I've even gotten some teary comments from people whose spouse or child is handicapped and at the game. They appreciate being included in this portion of the game. Then I continue by saying, as you face our flag with your right hand over your heart, to honor America with the playing of our national anthem. Now I've had veterans come up to me and say how much they appreciate the part about facing the flag and placing your hand over your heart. Now seeing who all these comments come from, I take them all very seriously. Now, your marketing staff may have something completely different that they want read for the National Anthem, and that's fine. Go with what they have. I just like to be prepared in case they don't. Now, this all goes back to your preparation and rehearsing. I have an app on my phone that I can record my own voice. I use it to record myself reading different types of copy. Now, when I play it back, I want to see if I sound the way I want to for each style of read. Many field hockey games begin with what's called an international walkout. Both teams line up on their sidelines in front of their bench, and the official leads both lines out onto the field up the midline. When they get to midfield, the lines split off and walk toward their goal until both teams are facing the crowd. And that's when you begin any welcome reads that you were given. Now, what I've discovered is I want to end my welcome to the site copy just as both teams are completely lined up at midfield. If I start reading as they begin to walk out with the officials, I would finish well before they finish lining up. Now that 10 to 15 seconds of dead air seems to last forever. So I ask marketing, is it okay if I wait for the teams to get going part way before I start reading my copy? You see, I want to finish my copy just as they finish their walkout. Some colleges in their scripts have you introduce the officials. Now when I see that, I see that as my opportunity to introduce myself to the game officials so they can get their pronunciations of their names. At the high school level, I would also use this as my opportunity to say that if I see a signal for each foul, I will announce what the call was. And if there's time before a restart of play, 
to also announce a short explanation of the call. For example, stick obstruction on the Hornets, using your stick to prevent your opponents from playing the ball. Now, I will also tell officials that I will not talk over the game. If I see that the game restarts too quickly for me to explain the call, then I won't say that. I feel it's important for me to tell the officials that I respect their jobs and I don't ever want to step on the game just to make an announcement. Now, I've had head coaches and fans at high school games tell me how much they appreciate me explaining those calls because field hockey can be difficult to understand at first. So anything I can do to promote the game without being a cheerleader, I'm going to do. Now this usually isn't an issue at the college level. Officials blow their whistle and players immediately adjust and restart play. There just isn't time to explain calls at this level. This is different from basketball where you take the ball out of bounds to restart play. The game restarts instantly. And that's okay. Remember, we don't want to step on top of the game. Most of the whistles in a game are just for a few types of fouls, and these don't result in a card that we referred to earlier. One is obstruction. That's using your body to prevent your opponent from playing the ball. Think of boxing someone out. You'll see the official make this signal. Stick obstruction is using your stick to prevent your opponent from playing the ball. Think using your stick to knock an opponent's stick away. The official will signal this way with one arm straight and they'll come down on their straight arm. A third call is third party obstruction. That's when two players from opposing teams are playing for the ball at the same time. Then a third player comes into this action and that creates an advantage one way or the other. You'll see the official do this, kind of waving an obstruction call. Another common foul is when a player has the ball hit their foot. You'll hear a whistle and the official will reach back and touch their foot. The other team gets possession immediately and goes the other way. One thing that doesn't happen very often, but you need to be aware of, is something called a bully. That occurs when there's a whistle, but neither team is directly responsible for the stoppage of play. Now that could happen if there's an injury where the official didn't see what caused it, or an object gets onto the field making it unsafe. You'll see the officials hold both arms straight out in front of them and move their hands up and down. Think of giving a massage. Now to administer a bully, you'll see a player from each team set up like they're taking a face off in ice hockey with the official placing the ball between them. The official then signals with their whistle for each player to touch each other's stick once, then they both make a play to secure the ball and the ball is ready to restart and game starts again. You'll often see teams pop the ball up and over defenders to pass it to a teammate upfield and that's perfectly legal. But if a lifted ball comes too close to an opponent in the official's judgment, the official can rule it dangerous and award the ball to the other team. You'll see the official raise one hand up to signal the lifted ball is dangerous. When these fouls occur in the field of play, there's an instant change of possession and play automatically continues. You may also see the goalie deliberately let the ball go into the net and on the surface that seems crazy. But the rules say that a goal can only be scored if the shot is taken from inside that arc that's in front of each goal. Just something for you to be aware of. Now if the goalie lets the ball purposely go in but it accidentally ricochets off their foot and goes in, it touched somebody inside that arc and it's a good goal. Now, if the attacking team sends the ball out of bounds over the end line, the defending team is awarded the ball on the line 15 meters off the end line. If you want, you can certainly say something like, ball played by the Eagles off the end line, the orange with a 15 meter hit. Now, if the defense hits the ball over the defensive end line, but not within the arc, the offense is awarded a long hit on that same 15 meter line. You can easily say something like, ball played off the end line by the Eagles, the orange, with a long hit. If the defending team plays the ball out of bounds off the end line, but it's done so inside that arc, it's a penalty corner. If the defending team commits one of those fouls that I mentioned earlier, 
inside that arc, it's also a penalty corner. You'll see the official point with both arms to one corner. Now teams design set plays for penalty corners, and lots of goals are scored this way, so this is an important play. Your first announcement, once you see this signal, is penalty corner awarded to the orange. The defending team can have five players, including the goalie, start on the goal line inside the net to defend the penalty corner. The offensive team will huddle up to call a specific play. Now they can have as many players as they want attacking the goal, but usually it's around seven. The rest of the players, both on offense and defense, start back at the midline. One offensive player is called the inserter. They are the, on the end line with the ball and they'll pass it in on the official's whistle. As they're setting up, you announce Gianna Rayom with the insertion. Now here's where things start to move really fast. The offensive players lined up on the arc in front of the net, each of which can receive a pass. Usually though, there's one or two stoppers. Their job is to stop the pass from the inserter and give it to a designated shooter. These stoppers will usually start crouched down with their stick flat on the ground. The shooter is usually behind the stopper. Now, if the initial shot is a strike, think a hockey slap shot, the ball must enter the goal no higher than the board in the back of the net. You'll hear that thunk. If not, the goal doesn't count. If the shot is a push or a flick, think a wrist shot in ice hockey the ball can enter the goal at any height. Now, if that initial struck shot is tipped, it can enter the goal at any height, and it's a good goal. Now, as a public address announcer, you need to know the numbers of these players so you can correctly sort out goals and assists. Identify the player's numbers before the insertion, who are the stoppers. They might get the assist if the shooter scores. Be thinking now, who are these players in case they get an assist or a goal? Now, usually in field hockey, if a goal is scored, there's only one assist awarded per goal, if any. But on a penalty corner, there can be up to two assists on a goal. Now, this does happen very fast, so use the other people in your booth to help you confirm your goal announcement. If you have access to instant replay, use it. You want to make sure you have it right before you say anything. Earlier, I talked about how fast this game can go and how you're expected to keep track and announce both goals and assists. In more instances than just a penalty corner, a skill that you'll need to develop is to learn to watch the attacking team and to see where individual players set up on the field. Start to look for the players without the ball. Who looks like they could be ready to get a pass to shoot? If the ball's at the top of the arc, who looks like they're setting up next to the cage for a possible tip-in? If someone shoots, who looks like they're getting in position for a rebound to score? Teach yourself to look at more than just who has the ball. Now when played well, the ball moves at lightning speeds and you need to be ready to see both who has it and who may get it next. As I said before, don't hesitate to use video replay. If it's there, use it because you want to get it right the first time. A penalty stroke is different than a penalty corner. That is when, the, in the official's judgment, a defender commits an intentional foul to prevent a goal from being scored. Now that includes the goalkeeper laying on top of the ball. The goalkeeper cannot freeze action this way like you can in ice hockey. You'll see the official raise one hand and point to the ground and to the goal with their other hand. Now the goalie in a penalty stroke must stand on the goal line while the shooter has the ball on a dot in front of the goal. The goalie cannot move until the ball is played. Action begins on the whistle and the shooter can only push the shot to try to score. Remember, we are reporters. We are tour guides. Our job is to tell people what happened and when. We don't provide commentary. Unless there's a goal, a card, a penalty corner, or a penalty stroke, 
there isn't much to say, and that's perfectly all right. One thing, though, that you can announce are substitutions. I like to do this because there's not a lot of scoring in these games, and players don't get their names called as much as they do in other sports. Now, these substitutions happen on the fly, like in ice hockey or in lacrosse. There doesn't have to be a stoppage in play for a substitute to enter the game. Just be ready to stay on top of these, because sometimes three or four or more players can come in at the same time. A video referral is used for the big decisions in the circle, usually around goal scoring opportunities or penalty situations. You'll see the official signal as if they're outlining a television set. Now, on-field officials can call as many referrals as they think they need during a game. Teams, though, are restricted to one referral per game, which they get to retain if their video referral comes back correct. If the video review goes against them, they lose the ability to call any more in that game. Now, obviously, if your facility doesn't have this capability, it won't be used. But if it does, you need to be ready to work with this. Some facilities have the ability to put a microphone at the scores table so the official themselves can announce what they're looking for and what the result of the review is. If that's the case, you don't say anything. If not, you need to connect with the table before the game to be sure that they radio up to you what they're looking for and what the result is. Now again, this goes back to your role as a reporter, as a tour guide, to tell the crowd what's going on. Now be sure though, not to announce the result of this video referral until both coaches have been notified. Keep an eye on the officials to make sure you see them tell both coaches the result before you announce anything to the crowd. If a game is tied at the end of regulation time, it goes to overtime. In overtime, it's played seven on seven, one of which is a goalkeeper. There are two 10-minute sudden victory periods. So once a goal is scored, the game is over. Now, if the game is still tied after these two sudden victory overtime periods, then it goes to a shootout. Each team picks five players for the shootout, and it's in a best of five format. The goalie starts on the goal line, and the shooter starts in the 23-meter area just outside the arc. On the official's whistle, the shooter has eight seconds on the scoreboard to score. Now, unlike a stroke, the player may play the ball off of a rebound. Now, the shootout continues, and it is completed until one of the following happens. Either eight seconds is elapsed and no goal. The attacker scores a goal the attacker commits a foul. The goalkeeper commits a foul in which the shootout is retaken. The goalkeeper commits an intentional offense in which a penalty stroke is awarded. We talked about those a few minutes ago. If the ball goes out of play over the back line or the sideline, and this includes the goaltender intentionally playing the ball over the line. If a penalty stroke is awarded because the goaltender committed an intentional foul, that stroke is taken and is taken by the two players involved in the shootout unless either is incapacitated or suspended as a result. The penalty stroke will take place before the next available shootout takes place and all the normal penalty stroke rules apply. At the end of the game, it's time to wrap things up. Begin by announcing the final score one more time, then go on to thank the fans for attending their game and for the, their support of the team. You can then go on to say when their next game is. Now, if it's an away contest, be sure to tell everyone how they can tune in. That could be on the radio, television, or live stats on the school's website. Either way, you want your fans to stay connected to the team when they're on the road, not just when they're home. Then you can announce their next home game, their date and time so they all know when they can come back and cheer again. Now I like to finish by doing something as simple as inviting them to buckle up and to enjoy a safe trip home. And when I announce for Syracuse University, I finish by saying, and wherever you go, 
Go Orange! Or if it's a Colgate game, and wherever you go, Go Gate! Well, I hope this has been a good use of your time and that I was able to help you feel more comfortable announcing either high school or collegiate field hockey. Please feel free to send any constructive comments to me here at my email address. Now, I hope you also browse the website publicaddressannouncer.org for more information and more resources. So thank you for watching Announcing the Game. I'm Tom Winicky, and I hope to hear you on the mic.